But when you got used to being chased, when I was a lost man, I got chased around by the cops for everything. You didn't be careful about what you, you grabbed and what you did. You know, it's amazing about that, though, how you, you know, when you're a lost person, you're doing evil. And you think the cops are always hassling you. And really, it's God that's dealing with you. You know, if you're out, you know, drinking and running around and doing all these things, it's God that's really using the law, right? That's, that's, the, that's the true use of civil government. Those cops weren't picking on you. You deserved it. You deserved a lot more than that. These lawless people that are out here right now and all this stuff that's going on, you know, we all know that we deserve a lot worse. But when you see that, you know that what they're doing openly, they're doing a lot more in secret. You know what I mean? And God says they wield not the sword in vain, right? That there's a purpose for civil government and there's a purpose for putting that down. And, you know, sometimes God uses even the depravity of man to deal with things. He really does. And um, we're seeing that. And that's something that we need to pay attention to and remember. God has a natural order of things that he deals with with in the way. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit here today, actually. This is going to be a different sermon for you. I want you to turn your Bibles to Exodus chapter 2. And this is my, my softball return sermon. Really nice. and Angela doesn't look like she believes me, but it's a good warm-up sermon. For this afternoon. No, honestly, it's something the Lord laid on my heart that God showed me uh, in my devotions. I had some great devotions while I was out there in the mountains and, and uh, you know, waking up early. Dad and I would go to the coffee shop at about 6 or 6.30. So said, that's not much of a vacation. You should be sleeping in. I don't sleep very well away from home anyway. And uh, I don't sleep in that well with, with uh, six kids in a hotel room in two different hotel rooms anyway. So you know how that goes, right? You that have been there, you understand how that works. If you don't, you will. <laughs> you have some, you'll get it. But anyway, so uh, I decided just to get up and go do my devotions. And dad and I would go there and he would do his and I would do mine. And, and uh, we'd sit. And I was amazed at how many people were studying their Bibles and reading in those coffee shops. Almost everywhere we went, there were people that were doing Bible studies out west. And they were inside the coffee shops and they were doing their Bible studies and and working on everything, I thought that was really interesting. And I got into some conversations. There was a there was a big theologian table there, full of full of twelve guys having a Bible study, and and they started asking questions. And I'm sitting there trying to concentrate on my devotions, and I'm like, I'm getting ready to answer this. And I I waited as long as I could to answer it, and none of them had an answer for him, and I just blurted it out. <laughs> And then I, I commenced into a, like a, a 10 minute, a 15, 20 minute conversation on, on doctrinal issues, on the atonement, on, on Christ's sufficiency, right? Uh, the sufficiency of the sacrifice, the atonement, who Christ is and everything else. And, and we had a good conversation. It was good though. But uh, yeah, it, it definitely was, was good. But, but, and those guys were, they were, they were, I believe those men were saved. I believe most of them understood the gospel and everything. And uh, they come from reform background. We won't hold that against them too hard. But, uh, uh, you know, you can easily, if you want to, you can easily get into an argument with anybody. It's not that hard to do. It's better to try to not to do that if you don't have to, unless it's something that's very, you know, unless you're going to have a long impact with these people and you're going to deal with them on a day-to-day -day basis or something. But uh, we just had a good time talking about Christ, and we just let it go with that. Amen. And, uh, and that was okay. Not everything has to be an argument, right? Um, if you stay long enough, it will be, right, Paul? <laughs> it ends up being that, doesn't it? <laughs> but anyway, Exodus chapter 2. We are going to talk about something here that the Lord showed me, and I was amazed by it, that, that God kind of drew it out of the text. When you start doing expository preaching, it, it almost becomes a habit. And then when you read the Bible, you read it in that same way, and you study it in the same way, and you start breaking it down the same way. But I want it to be an encouragement to the ladies here today. I want you to think about this very strongly, and the men too, for a proper perspective. But a little bit different of a sermon, but it's called the beauty and honor of true biblical feminism. You see, there is a true biblical feminism uh, that God put in every lady. And it is a beauty and an honor to see that. And it's something that we ought to understand. We ought to have a good grasp of it because it is something that God honors. And it is something that is very commendable and respectable and God blesses it. And I want you ladies to understand the importance of that. Then I also want you men to listen and to understand that and to think about it, the right perspective of how you're supposed to, you're supposed to cultivate that spirit, how you're supposed to encourage that, how you're supposed to encourage her in that same spirit. Uh, and 
It's amazing, really, because when we're about to get in, let's pray, and then we'll read, well, let's read Exodus chapter 2, verse number 2 to 4, and then we'll pray, and then, then I'll, I'll kind of explain it to you here. And the woman conceived and bare a son, and when she saw him that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. And when she could not longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein. And she laid it in the flags by the river's brink, and his sister stood afar off to wit what would be done to him. Let's pray. Father, please teach us today. Uh, edify us in, in your word, Lord. Teach us uh, to obey you and help us to learn what the lessons that you have for us here today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. I want you to understand something first about this. This entire chapter illustrates the beauty and honor of true biblical feminism. You know, when we think of feminism today, we think of it in a way that is, it, it's the world's version. See, Satan always has a version of what God had, of God's truth. Do you understand that? He always has that. So what does he try to do? He tries to sell women on, on, on the world's version or Satan's version or the God of this world's version of feminism and, and to get their eyes off of what true biblical feminism really is. And in this chapter, you see, you see the most natural way that a lady is made. You see that the heroes of this story really are the ladies in this chapter. They are the absolute heroes throughout this. There are a number of different times when the ladies are shown as being heroic, but all they're doing is the natural thing that God created them to do. Do you understand that? When that natural, when that natural spirit of, of, of true biblical feminism is, when it is taught, when it is, when it is, um, when it is uh, encouraged, then it naturally, it will come out. It has to, it will come out. But when you are taught something foreign, then that without natural affection comes in and it is, and, and when it is not uh, cultivated in the proper way, then ladies, you know, that without natural affection, I want you to say, that's not just dealing with homosexuality. You've got to understand that the, ch the church is long before uh, homosexuality was a problem did not teach on the biblical roles of man and women and teach and encourage women to do what God naturally created them to do and to be what God made them to be, right? We almost came into this unisex society and we've bought into that to where we don't train our daughters to be daughters and our sons to be sons, but we train them exactly the same, but God didn't make you exactly the same, right? He didn't. And God expects there to be a difference between ladies and men. He expects it. And he teaches it. Not only does he expect it, he put it in them. He put it in them naturally. So, the real and true champions in this chapter, the nature that shines brighter than ever in this chapter is true biblical feminism. It does. And you know what? Pastors need to make sure and preachers need to make sure that, and fathers need to make sure that they, that they preach and talk about and teach true biblical feminism. Because otherwise, what happens is the only thing people hear is what we're against, but not what God is for. Do you understand how dangerous that is? People need to know what God is for, not just what God is against. And we need to make sure that we teach that and we, and we nurture that in our children, our daughters and our sons, that we nurture in them that, that what God is for, not just what God is against. It's very important because you, you can get jaded if, if you're not careful. And so can they. You know, it is God that gets the glory for making women, from taking the woman from a man and making her the fairer sex. She may rightly be called the weaker vessel, and that she is when it comes to bone structure as compared to the strength of the man, and when it comes to being deceived by the serpent. But when it comes to the strength of her God-given nature, of that true biblical feminism, no weakness is seen, only a strength and a purpose. There is a beauty in the strength of and a purpose of a true biblical woman. There is an absolute beauty there that is irresistible to the, the God-fearing nature that God put inside of a man when he sees that. There is a natural, a supernatural, and a natural attraction to that when he sees that. If he's looking for the right thing. If a young man is looking for a woman that is going to honor God, that's going to obey God, that's going to follow him and practice true biblical feminism as it is seen in the scriptures, and, and just that nature that God has given them, then guess what? He is going to be attracted to that. He's going to see that in that young lady. He's going to see that in that person. A at any age, whether you're looking for a wife later on in life, you're going to look for those characteristics. You're going to look for that. 
So we watch in amazement and we follow the story down this Nile River to see the true beauty of that biblical feminism. And we should marvel at one of God's greatest creations, and that is woman. I think it's I, I think we underestimate what how God uses ladies and I think ladies underestimate their value and if we're not careful we will underestimate their value all right we will do that if we're not careful and I want to encourage you not to do that and this story will illustrate that it will show that it is a lesson to husbands who truly think that they know their wives but the longer you're married the more you'll realize that you'll, what you'll learn about her and from her. The more you study woman, the less you'll realize you know. I mean that seriously. The less you realize that you know. And that's why it takes a lifelong of marriage to understand and to grow and to learn one another. And just when you start to get it, you go home. Right? This is when you start to understand it all. Have a good perspective of it. You can pass it on to the next generation, and then God takes you home. Right? That's how it works. But it's a lifelong process. So number one, let me say this. The narrative starts with a woman and her baby. The most simplest of things. There is no more of a sacred earthly connection, save the husband and the wife, than a mother and her baby. The most natural of affections is for a mother to take care of her baby to nurture, to protect, to guard. It is very natural. It is the way God made them. See, God put that inside of them. You have, you have to understand that. God placed that. Just like he placed in the man to be a protector, a provider, and all those things, he placed in the woman. He placed in her to nurture, to care, to love a child. It is the most natural of affections is for a mother to take care of her baby to protect it and to guard it. But we see it in all of creation. Think about the bear, for instance. In Proverbs 17, 12, let a bear robbed of her whelps meet a man rather than a fool in his folly. You ever, tried, you ever seen somebody make the mistake of getting between a bear and her cubs? A mama bear and her cubs? She will kill the male bear. She will go after the male bear and try to kill him before she will let that, that um, father of that cub kill it. Now, what does that show? Does that show that man and beast are the same? No, it shows that we are the same designer. That's what it shows. It shows that the same designer made us. And he put that inside of us, right? It doesn't prove evolution. It proves that we have a same designer. You see, the mother's natural tendency is to protect her young. And there is nothing more beautiful and honoring than to see a mother protect her children. It says, and the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. And when she could no longer hide him, she took him for an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein. And she laid it in the flags by the river's brink. You know, this woman, she did her best. Putting herself in danger to hide the child as long as she could. And I don't think we will ever understand the angst that went through her heart to hold that child against her breast, to keep it quiet, to keep it hushed the best she could without anybody finding out that there was a male child there, right? It reminds me of what the Jews must have went through in Germany and some of those people that hid them, right? To keep them from being found. How quiet those babies had, they had to try to make those babies be. Same desperation there. By the way, that's the same beast system spirit of Antichrist. Same one. Same one that Pharaoh had. Same one that Germany had. And same one that the 60 million babies that have been butchered in this nation have. Same spirit. Satan would have that woman believe there is something. Uh, Satan would have a woman believe there is something more grand to her life. Right? Because there's a satanic form of feminism out there in this world that teaches they should be searching for a career, finding their purpose in the world, that there's something else for her besides what God has for her. Isn't that like that? Isn't that what Satan always does? He does it to the man too. 
When he gets married and he has a family, he tries to tempt him that there's something else better for you out there. So he brings a harlot along. He brings somebody to seduce them along. He brings something along to seduce them and to steal them away. Why? To steal them from that simplicity that is in Christ Jesus. That simplicity that God has laid down. To tell you that there's something better, right? This woman is protecting her baby, really, from, from a forced abortion. I think about that, how it likens it today, from child sacrifice, right? That's all it is, the same thing. If we, would, if we would just look back here to the last chapter, we would see another of the most sacred duties of a woman ever, and that is midwifery, right? Those midwives that were birthing, helping the, the birth of babies, they were given sure houses by God for protecting life. They used subtlety against the serpent to protect the babies alive. I've heard some people say, well, God, you know, God, God was okay with what they're doing, but he wasn't necessarily okay with what they said. Why? It doesn't say anywhere God wasn't happy with what they said, does it? It says that they were told to obey the higher power, right? And they did. They obeyed God, and God made them sure houses. When it comes to life and death, who do you obey? Right? You may come down to that place where you have to make that decision. Think about that. But you know, God prospered and gave them sure houses, it says. You see, that is true biblical feminism. It is the truest sense of the nature God gave a woman to preserve life. It is without natural affection to go to a doctor in a white coat to have a baby pulled out of your womb and suck its brains out and kill it. See, that's very graphic. Not really. What's graphic is what they're doing. I want my children to know that it's absolute murder. I want my children to know that, that you are, they are absolutely taking a baby, and it is no different than throwing it into the fire of Moloch. It is, no different, it is no different than bashing it against the rocks. It is no different because that guy has a white coat on. Do you understand that? It is not any different. And for the woman to stand, it's even worse because there's a seduction that goes along with it. There is this teaching and a seduction that goes along with it with deception that, that tries to teach that there's something acceptable about it because some guy in a white coat does it. It's even worse. I maintain to you that doctors are the real wizards today. They are the sorcerers today. They are. They are. See, that's too extreme for some people. But it's about as extreme as this King James Bible. It's about time you call a spade a spade and stop sugarcoating it. It's murder. That's what it is. And that's what they're doing. And that's what they're legislating. And that's what they're getting away with it. And then, and then I'm going to show you later on, but I'm going to say this more than once because I'm getting, I'm getting kind of excited. Remember, this was my softball sermon. Uh, but uh, I, I'm, get, I, I'm getting, but, but I, I think about how these people tell us that they're going to protect our children. You're, you're going to protect my children. Wait, you're the same people that murder them. Isn't that like letting the fox guard the hen house? It, yeah. We'll get to that in a little while here. That was a preview. That was, that was. You see, the butchering and murdering women we have today in America is without natural affection. It is highly devil-possessed. It is satanic. For a woman to take her own seed and feed it over to a doctor in a white coat to murder it. It is devilish, satanic, and wicked to the core. And the man that pays for it, I, I, scarce call, I, I don't really want to call him a man. Thank God for Calvary and thank God for forgiveness because they can be forgiven. Just like you and I, God's grace is greater than all our sin. But think very purposely about this. You take your, when you, who, who you take your advice from on what true feminism is. Now this poor woman, she does all she could do and she had to send her baby in a basket down the Nile, right? And she couldn't bear to look upon him. She could not preserve his life any other way. What must have went through her head? We know God led her to do it, but I can't imagine the prayers that went up to the Lord and the angst in her heart to send her baby off like that. She must have been led by the Lord though because God had his hand on Moses from the beginning and he knew it. In his providence that he would use him. I don't know if we can fully understand it. But we cannot fully understand God's ways. Not on this side of eternity. 
Verse 3 tells us, And when she could no longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein. And she laid it in the flags by the river's brink. With great care, she put that basket together, right? Think about that as she's making that basket, what she's thinking about placing that baby inside of it. Can you imagine that? I can't even imagine thinking that. As she's making it, as she's putting it together, she daubed it with pitch and mortar to make it waterproof, right? As she's putting that child in there and she's placing it inside that basket to push it down the river and never to see again. She's saying this is the best chance he has to live because Pharaoh's soldiers are coming. How could you willingly take your ba go, go to an abortion clinic and take a child and murder it? That's why these people that say black lives matters are liars. Black lives matter because they don't believe that. If they did, why wouldn't they stand like armed guards in front of Planned Parenthood, who's murdering 48% of their people every year or something like that? Why, if they really thought, why don't you go topple Planned Parenthood? Why topple a statue of, of, of uh, Andrew Jackson or somebody else? Why wouldn't they be toppling Planned Parenthood? You burn down Wendy's, but you don't burn down Planned Parenthood. See the hypocrisy and the satanic? No, I'm not saying you should go do that. I know that's not the answer. I'm just revealing your absolute hypocrisy. Because that's what it is. You're a liar. If you really cared about black people, you'd be standing in front of those places. Bet you they'd have the FBI and the cops there to stop that, wouldn't they? Bet you they wouldn't let you get past the front sidewalk with that now, would they? Would they? Let's be real. They arrested a guy for getting rowdy in front of a Planned Parenthood, but they let these people burn the whole city down. That's how you know they're a bunch of liars. Okay. Isn't that true? Come on, man. They're burning everything down, but you skip Planned Parenthood, and they're killing your young. They're, they're butchering them, and they're laughing. And Margaret Sanger said the most, the, the, the most merciful thing you could do is put to death a black baby from a poor family. Right? Yet you laud the same party that, 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 does your, that, that, that ruins your whole future? Right? And if black lives really, I, I'm going to, I, I really want to, I'm going to stop right now and move on with my sermon, but I, I think I'm going to do a broadcast called if black lives really mattered. And then I'm going to list a whole bunch of things. That's it. That's what I'm doing. All right. Anyway, we got to move on. But anyway, because if it did, then you'd stop all the gangbangers from killing each other. You'd stop four year old girls from being shot point blank in the head in Chicago by a bunch of black thugs. But I'm the racist guy, right? Why? Because I just tell you the truth, so I become your enemy. Right? And the most innocent of your lives, you watch being murdered. And you not only do that, but the black man drives her up to the abortion clinic. Now, it's wicked for any color. I'm just telling you. You look at the proportional difference and the amount of numbers, right? And you think about that. I guarantee you that if that if anybody tried to anybody tried to stand in there and prevent Planned Parenthood from doing abortions, you'd have every FBI unit, you'd have the U.S. Army against you, you'd have U.S. Marshals. They'd be flying planes over. They'd be doing everything they possibly could. But they don't when you burn a city down to the tune of half a billion dollars. Yeah, who are who? Who's fooled by this antichrist nonsense? I'm not. It's a big game is all it is, and they know it. They know it. All the groups know it. I wouldn't be surprised if I did a little bit of research and you follow it around that all the top players are shaking hands together. Anyway, we'll move on. We'll leave that conspiracy theory for the future. But um, next, we see the true spirit also of true biblical feminism in Moses' sister. I think it's amazing that you see this. And God put this for you to watch and for us to learn. And his sister stood afar off to wit what would be done to him. So we find that his sister, she's sitting there 
uh, far off. She's standing there to look at that baby. She has so much care for that young child, right? That baby, her baby brother. We find that, again, that true biblical feminism in Moses' sister. And no doubt she was taught to love the baby by her mother. And she saw the angst in her mother and how much her mother cared for the child. And we think about little girls, the natural tendency as they play with dolls and naturally as they learn things from their mothers and they want to care for a baby, they practice changing a diaper. And like many other girls, they learn to, uh, you know, to, to do all those things and to take care of a baby and to feed it and to, and to help give it a bath and all those other things like that, that they learn naturally through that. You know, I look at my, my daughters as they learn to change diapers and care for their, their little sisters and everything else like that. Those are all natural things that God places inside of a woman, a lady. It's uniquely designed. That's why, that's why there's only two genders. All right. That's why there's only two genders. There is male and female. And whatever DNA God wrote you in, that's what you are. And you can't change that for anything. I don't care if you change your looks. I don't care if you chop things off. I don't care if you add things to it. It doesn't matter. You don't change what God made you because you can't change the DNA. You can't make it different. You can't change what God made you. Right? There's no difference there. You can't do that. So God made those young ladies. Now, when we see young men act like young ladies, there is a outside force. That change that. There's a societal issue there. There's something that changed that. Something was not nurtured inside of that young man or that young woman. Right? To cause that. A foreign, unnatural affection occurred there. It's not natural. Right? You know, I think, I think true biblical feminism, it shines through, and we see it here in this text. We see it, and by the way, it's not without adventure. Uh, this young girl went through a lot of things to, ser- to, to protect her brother. You see, this sister, she watches on as the baby is in the water to see what will happen. She cared about her little brother. She was a true young lady with a shining biblical feminism. We see the heroes of this story, again, are women. The true feminist spirit from God that he created them with shines through. He made them like that. The mother had it, and so did the daughter. And I want to ask mothers today, are you nurturing that true biblical feminism in your daughters? Do you have their roles in the proper order? Do you teach them to be ladies? Do you teach them to be soft and gentle by your example? You teach them to be nurturing. You have to be the example of submission and knowing and nurturing that true biblical feminism in them. It matters how you train them. It matters what you teach them. And it definitely matters what you practice before them. It was quite natural for Moses' sister to find out what happened to him. And to know what would become of him. You know, she couldn't bear to wonder the rest of her life. She had to know. We ought to teach and prepare our children for the roles God would have them to be in. That's knowing those roles and understanding them. God made man a provider, a protector, and so on. He also made the woman to be the keeper at home, the caretaker of the home, and the children. That's what he made them to be. I want to ask you a question. If God never has you do anything but be, as a lady, let me ask you a question. If God never has you do anything but be a godly wife or godly daughter, and serve your family. Is that enough for you? Is it enough for you? Do you have, do you, do you have uh, illusions of grandeur? Do you, do you have desires that go beyond what God has for you? As young ladies, I, I, I want you to understand that godliness with contentment is great gain. You ought to be content with whatever role God has for you. Are you content to be a wife? A mother, are you content to be that? As you look to your future, are you content to be that? Is that enough for you? Or do you need to have something else? Do you need something else to fulfill your life more? Then what I say to you, if you do, what you are saying is, is that what God has made you with, created you to be, is not enough. You are not content to be what God made you to be. 
Well, I think women could be so much more, you might say. Well, who said they couldn't? We didn't, we didn't say anything about ability. I said permissibility. I didn't say anything about ability. I didn't say you could. There's a lot of things you could do. By the way, there's a lot of things as a man I could do. But I don't do them. Right? It's not a matter of ability. It's a matter of permissibility. It's a matter of what God permits and what God made you to be. See, we've been sold a bill of goods today. We've been sold the world's view of feminism, which says that it's not enough for you to be a mother, a, go a godly wife, a godly mother. That's not enough. You need more. Then you have the people out in the world that look, and they look at mothers and they think, well, that's, you know, they have a grand career. And some of you, you go to work and, and they, they wonder, well, why is your wife at home? Right? They wonder that. How come your wife's not, not working? How come she's home with the children? How come she's doing this? They wonder that, don't they? Let your answer be the children that you raise. Let your answer be the godly seed that you raise up. Let your answer be what the word of God says. Let it be that. She was involved in many things. This, this young lady, as she was looking. But I think she taught, I think her mother taught her what, what, what she was supposed to be doing. We ought to teach and prepare our children for what God would have them to be. Some of these things are natural to the feminine spirit, but still and yet Miriam's mother must have taught her by example and by teaching what she should be. Teaching them the difference in the sexes. Do you teach your children? You know, today there's no teaching on that. You realize, there, you realize, I, look, I want everybody to look up at me for a second. I want you to realize what's being taught today. Yeah, nothing. That's true. That's true. But what they are teaching today is that there is no difference between men and women. They are teaching that we are all the same. That there is no difference. You have to understand that's what's being taught. And what I'm telling you is if you, by example, don't teach your children and walk correctly, they are going to fall for what the world is selling. Because the lights of Sodom are very attractive. That's why you have to be, you have to be steadfast, unmovable. You have to be that person that doesn't budge when it comes to these things. Look, I, there are things that I just won't move on. And, and, and teaching the difference between Sons and daughters is one of those things by God's grace that I'm not going to budge on. And, 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 as, and as stubborn as they are, God gave me a forehead harder than their foreheads. I know that when God called me, he showed me that text. He said, you know what? Don't be afraid of their faces. I've given you a forehead harder than their foreheads. I'll break any feminist head with this head. And I'm not kidding you because it was sent from God. And I know I'm telling you, I hate feminism. I hate it. I hate the world's feminist. I hate it. I absolutely deplore it. I hate it. it, it those Jezebels, they follow me. They come around me. They accuse because they hate me. Because they hate the God I stand for, and they hate the truth that I stand for. I'm going to tell you what. If you're a bossy, nagging woman, you're going to hate what I preach too. But I'm going to tell you something. I love you no matter what you think. You may not think I love you, but I'm telling you the truth because I do love you. And you may think I don't, but I would do anything in this world that God wanted me to do for you. But I will not compromise that book for that. Which means I won't send my daughters out in the world to work for somebody else. I won't do it. They're going to stay in my house and they're going to be raised by me. And when they get a husband, then he takes care of them. And if that husband looks at me and says, well, I'm not going to take care of her. She's going to get a job. I'm like, well, you ain't getting her. You ain't getting her then because you don't deserve her. You little lazy bum. You know what? People don't like that, but they used to call that manhood. Biblical manhood. See, my daughters are something worth getting. I didn't, I'm not going to raise them all these years just to hand them over to some slob somewhere. Someone that doesn't know the difference in the roles. Someone that doesn't understand what a man's supposed to do and what a woman is supposed to do. 
It's the way it is. I'm going to tell you what, some people have already, they, they, they've went out and they've done it the wrong way and they've dealt with the consequences of it. They've watched their, their daughters not be taken care of. I remember one young man that was in this church years ago, I won't mention any names because I don't want to hurt anybody, but I remember years ago, this, this young man came to this church and he, he married this other young lady here and, um, she was working 50 hours a week and he was working like 25. And then he was complaining about her not getting enough food on the table and doing all this other work and all this other stuff. Some of that was all my fault. I don't know. <laughs> But anyway, it's an interesting situation, right? And I know some of you haven't heard this before. And if you haven't, I'm not mad at you. I'm mad at the devil. And I, but, but I am going to tell you the truth. Because a lot of people never heard this before. They never heard any teaching on the, on the biblical, the roles of the, of the husband and the wife, the, of the man and the woman. They never hear any of that. Because you know why? Because they know that if they talk about that, their offerings will go down. They know if they talk about that, they'll make people upset. But look, we have an epidemic today, not only in our churches, but in our world. Okay? But let's take it to the churches. We are losing children right and left from our churches. Now, one of those reasons, and it's not all of it, but one of those reasons that they are lost in that is that they don't have a mom at home. The mom is out somewhere else running around. Now, that. It's not always the case. Sometimes children rebel. I understand. But in this case, you trace the numbers of the amount of mothers that are not in the home with their children raising, and some stranger is raising their children in public school, right? Teach, right? Some heathen is teaching them everything that you stand against, right? And then you wonder why that happens. See, this is why that true biblical feminism is a beautiful thing to see. It is the most noble of, of spirits that God gives a lady. Number three, we see it in the most unusual place, this spirit, and that's in Pharaoh's daughter. Look at verse five. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river, and her maidens walked along by the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. Now think, now I think it is important to note that curiosity is definitely part of the true biblical nature of a woman. They are very curious. <laughs> Women are extremely curious. And when there's an improper balance of that, it's called nosy. <laughs> Just so you know, it's actually called busy bodies in other men's affairs. Right? Right. They are the best, women are the best investigators, right? I mean, it just are. I, I'm laughing at it because I'm remembering a, we were listening, we were out Paul and Cindy's probably about a month ago or so, and the situation came up and somebody was relaying a, a testimony and Cindy was listening to it. And Cindy, Cindy was like a court reporter. She was like a, she was like a lawyer. She was like, objection. And I was like, wow. And I listened to her how she said, but he said this the first time, but then he didn't say this the second. And I'm like, oh. And I'm like, Paul, you better not try anything at all. You're never going to get away with anything at all. But that shows you how women, they listen. They actually listen. We're guys. It's like, and we hear what we want to hear, like the last three words. That's how, that's how we got, blah, 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 blah. oh, and then we hear the last three words, right? But a lady, she's listening to every word you said and looking at it the way you said it and then filing it back in a recorder later. I, I'm not kidding. I'm serious. Right? You're laughing, Angela, because you know it's true. You can't keep any secrets. I know. It's just, un I mean, it doesn't work. But you know what? She inherited that curiosity. It comes naturally for a woman. Eve had it. They got it from Eve. Right? She had it. 
It's not necessarily wrong. It's just it needs to be balanced correctly. If you notice that God uses natural courses to do his supernatural work, though, because he used that woman's curiosity to get that baby, to protect that baby. He did. He used it, but he uses God always over and over again. I've tried to talk to you about this over the last month, that God uses the natural and then he supernaturally performs his work, but he does it through the natural way. You're, people are looking for something outside of that. You don't have to. God does his work with, through the plain path of duty. He does it through the plain natural things that he created. And then he supernaturally does things through that. God uses the natural courses. Over and over again, we see that being used in the Bible, how God uses him for his glory to fulfill his will. He uses the depravity of man. He used Pharaoh's depravity to burn that whole nation down, to get them to give all their riches over to Israel and to march them out of the land. And he used Pharaoh's depravity to do it. Yep. That's what he did. And he said he was going to do it too. He said, this is how I'm going to do it. And he said, and he goes, and he goes, you go tell Pharaoh. He said, God said this to Pharaoh in the beginning. Moses, he told Moses to tell Pharaoh. Now, if you don't let my firstborn son go, I'm going to kill yours. And then do you realize that God was so merciful that he gave him 11 plagues? Or was it 10? 10 plagues before he killed his firstborn son. Each step of the way, Pharaoh kept digging deeper and deeper. His heart was hardening more and more. Right? But God told him what he was going to do. He said, I'm going to kill your firstborn son if you don't let mine go. And he did. That's what he did. The daughter of Pharaoh being very curious about this. She looks in to see what's going on there. You'll also notice the modesty of this woman. I believe she was, she had these maidens along the riverside. So there wasn't any men around. She had this, even this woman, you know, here's Pharaoh's daughter, you know, a pagan, but still understood that, you know, she had all these maidens around, right? And she was doing that. Plus that kept the men away, by the way, when that baby was found. <laughs> Think about that. So her curiosity gets the best of her and she sends her maiden to go fetch the ark, right? Go grab the ark. So they go grab it for her and bring it to her. I'll tell you this. It's a good it's a good practice not to leave your wife in any suspense about anything. Secrets don't go well with marriages. You know, if you can fight in anybody on this earth, it uh, it ought to be your wife. But I would caution you not to overburden her with too many things as well. There are things that they that, that ladies just don't have to deal with and they shouldn't have to. Right? And you don't need to really tell them. Um, I'm not talking about sin or wickedness or anything. I'm talking about just things. Right? Things in, in your mind that you need to take to the Lord, you take it to the Lord. You don't need to share it with your wife. Just same goes for her. She takes it to the Lord. But there are things that, you know, husbands ought to be careful about. Matters of the home and family, matters with your your life and things like that. Don't leave a woman in suspense. It doesn't go well. Women, the way that God designed them, they they need stability. They have to have stability. That's that's the way why God created the man and woman the way that he did. The curiosity of the woman unchecked is a dangerous thing as well. That's why the Bible warns us about being busybodies in other men's affairs. They are all apt to nose into other men's affairs and families and businesses that is none of their business. You have to be careful about that. There are, if a lady is not doesn't have the proper checks and balances on that curiosity first, she'll put her nose where it doesn't belong. Right? Look, I'm going to tell you something. When you're too busy in somebody else's affairs, you're not busy enough in your own. Hey, Amen. You ain't got enough to do. If you got enough, to, if you got to, if you're too, if you're hypercritical over everything and everyone and everybody else's family and everybody else, you ain't got enough to do in your own. Hey, Amen. That's just the truth, friend. That's the way it is. But that's why God says I would that the younger mar women would what marry and do what bear children and guide the home right why cuz they are apt to get in trouble amen look god said it i hope you believe it if you don't it's still true <laughs> it's still true isn't it 
Look what it says in verse number six. And when she had opened it, she saw the child and behold, the babe wept and she had compassion on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews children. You know, this baby does something very natural and that's cry. Babies naturally cry, don't they? But God again uses that natural thing to perform the supernatural. That babe, that the babe wept, right? And Pharaoh's daughter naturally had what? Compassion on it. It was in that lady. It was in her when she hears a baby crying, right? She saw it. She had compassion. That's natural. That's a natural compassion. It is a most beautiful thing when you think about it. See, God used that natural affection of that woman. You know, her father is the king of Egypt and says all the baby boys must die. But the cry of that baby speaks louder than Pharaoh's order to her own heart. You think about that. I mean, Pharaoh said all of them got to die. If she finds one, she's like, I ain't killing it. You know, at this time, she cares nothing for Pharaoh's order, just like the Hebrew midwives cared nothing for Pharaoh's order. But the baby's life spoke louder. That's the natural motherly instinct inside of a woman, that it spoke louder than a standing army against her. Right? Now, what did God say would happen in the end times? that they would be without natural affection. Even, it says, it makes plain in Romans chapter one, what does it say? Even their women. Why did it say it like that? Because that's when you know it's bad. When even their women have lost that normal and natural affection that God has given them. It's the downfall of society. But this woman here would defy all logic. She would go through all danger and face down any enemy to save that baby's life. It wasn't survival of the fittest. She would just as soon face down Pharaoh to preserve the life before she would let the baby be killed. She was defying his order. I want you to think about this, though, how God worked in this. Because you also notice that the only house the baby could be protected in was Pharaoh's house. He made the decree, and God caused Pharaoh to mock his own order and use his own daughter's feminine nature to do it. Do you see the wisdom and power of God here? You ought to. 1 Corinthians 2.23, turn there. We've got about five verses to read. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than man. Wiser than men. And the, foolish, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. What did Pharaoh say? The same Pharaoh, the lineage, it wasn't the same Pharaoh, but what did the kings of Egypt say? I am Pharaoh. What did he say to Joseph? This is how they viewed their kings, right? I, and Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without thee shall no man lift up his hand and foot in all the land of Egypt. Think about that. In his own house, God preserved Moses to eventually lead the Israelites out of there. Mm -hmm. So powerful, yet God uses this simple and natural chain of events, and none can deny he used that true feminine spirit to bring the entire nation down. See, ladies, you underestimate what God wants to do in your life. You underestimate your value and you underestimate your work. Absolutely underestimate it. And I think that some of us as husbands underestimate that too. The true value. Do you see the power that God truly gave you as a lady? That if you will be that lady that God made you to be, what, can, what he can use you for, that preachers and princes will come from your wombs? 
and you will change the world through the womb and through natural means? Didn't God say that your house would be preserved? That you would be preserved, that you would be saved through childbearing? That's the place, the home. It is the most exalted place for a lady to be. It is a castle indeed. And there is nothing more natural than to see her doing what God made her to do. Number four or five, I can't remember now. We see God use Miriam in a most natural way again. Moses' sister comes again with that, with that true ingenuity and natural creativity of the feminine spirit. Ladies have that in them. They have that ingenuity, that natural creativity that's inside of them. How quickly Moses' sister thought on her feet. Think about that. Being a woman, she looked into the eyes of Pharaoh's daughter and knew that she had compassion on that babe. She knew it by looking at Pharaoh's, Pharaoh's daughter that she was taken with that baby. And she knew the babe had stolen her heart and the cry for food. Being a very natural cry must be answered. So she offers her services and, and her help to Pharaoh's daughter. Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for thee? Is it not sad today that we see young girls that know nothing of nursing a baby or what that means to naturally care for a child? They look at breastfeeding as gross. I've seen some young girls young ladies be with child and fornicate too soon and be young. And they look at that nursing a child as something that's disgusting and gross. They can't bear it. They can't stand it. That's something. That natural affection is not there. They look at, at, the, at the things that God made them to do as if they were gross. You know, many of these babies grow up without natural affection of their mothers, and it impacts their lives in the most vulnerable years of their lives. But this girl, knowing that, her, that the woman could not nurse herself, her, or the baby herself, she said, I can find a woman to nurse it for you. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go. And the maid went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, take this child away and nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it. Now that is some, that is some subtlety right there. That is, some, <laughs> that is God. Because here it is right here. This is Pharaoh's daughter, Pharaoh's own daughter, handing that baby back to the mother, a Hebrew, and paying her to do it. What a surprise it must have been to Moses' mother to have the baby back in her arms. To nurse it up until it was almost weaned, which I think at that time would have been around four years old or so. But uh, I think they nursed longer back then because of the food that they had and climate and everything. But I'm not sure about that. I've heard that. She was actually paid to do something she would have done anyway for free, right? She never thought when she let her child go that she would have it returned to her with pay. I'll tell you this, if you and I will give our children to the Lord God, he'll reward us richly with blessings that we'll follow. If we'll raise them right and raise them as if they are God's first, then we will reap and the blessings and rewards later in life. I also think it's amazing that God used the natural feminine spirit of the woman to help financially in the home. Do you see how here she's being paid right in the home to do what a mother does? It reminds me of that Proverbs 31 woman, that there's finances, there's money, there's things that she can do from that home, right, to, to, to bring in extra money and things of her husband's estate. And that's exactly what was done here. Notice that God didn't have her go out and get a career, didn't have her go do anything else. She was right at home, doing what she always did. Amen? I think it's important, isn't it? I think it's a lesson God has for us there. You know, much like that, it's much like that Proverbs 31 one, but you can read that yourself. Another lesson we learn from this is not to look for high and mighty things to do, 
but the most natural things in the plain path of duty. Some people want to do things for God and they think about it on a grand scale of things, but it's the plain path of duty that needs to be trod. You know what I mean? There's people say, well, I want to be a missionary. Well, you're right here. There's plenty of places, right? There's street corners. There's places to go preach, right? There's places to go right here, right? And as a mother, you might be the one to raise preachers. We're going to get to that in a second. In fact, we'll get to that right now. Lastly, see how God used that feminine spirit to raise a leader. Mothers raise leaders. Fathers teach their boys, yes, and their girls. But mothers are the ones that raise leaders. Verse number 10, and the child grew and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter and, she be and he became her son. And she called his name Moses. And she said, because I drew him out of the water. And it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown that he went unto his brethren and looked up on their burdens and he spied an Egyptian smiting a Hebrew, one of his brethren. So the baby would grow up to be a great man. And it was necessary for that great man to have a great woman in his life. A boy needs a man, a father in his life. Yes, and so does a daughter. They need a father to raise them up and teach him to be a man. But this young man will be the most imbalanced man if he does not have a great woman in his life. A mother, a God-fearing mother. Moses' mother was used, Miriam was used, and Pharaoh's daughter was used. All these women, that in, in the sense exercised a true feminine spirit. We ought not underestimate the importance of a boy having a good mother in his life. A God-fearing mother who teaches in the Bible and raises him according to biblical standards. She'll be there to teach him how to treat women. How a lady should act. She will teach him the role of a biblical mother and wife and powerfully shape his future. She will teach him compassion and love for others. She'll teach him a, a wife is submitted to her husband. And that she is a keeper at home and has a meek and quiet spirit. Or sadly, she will teach him the opposite. And what he should not marry. She could be guilty of teaching him manipulation like Jacob's mother taught him for years. And he would be chastened of the Lord and go through much heartache and pain due to the bad example of a mother he had. Teach him to lie and deceive his dad and not be honest in all the duties. That he had. Moses' mother herself would never lead millions, but she did through her son. Right? You know, women were never meant to be in charge of a nation, but they are in charge of the next best thing. The hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. Hmm. I believe that. Spurgeon said that, you know, he attributed his salvation, obviously, to God's grace, but he all talked about his mother who prayed for him. She said she prayed for him to be a Christian, but not a Baptist. And he said, Mother, God did exceedingly abundantly above all that you asked or thought. <laughs> yeah, that was good. But his mother prayed for him, right? Some of the greatest leaders of this nation that ever led this nation in the past, their mothers, they attributed to their mothers, many of them, right? Oh, woman, if you only took your place more seriously and never let Satan, the God of this world, sell you a feminism that is most unbecoming, if you would stick to your God-given natural faculties and the exalted place that God has put you in so much glory is upon you and so much blessing as you shape the world for Jesus Christ but if you lose sight of the true mission that God has for you and that true biblical biblical feminine spirit that God placed inside of you if you lose sight of that then you lose sight of your true mission what God has called you and I'm telling you there are so many today you say pastor do you believe women are called to be missionaries in their home. Do you believe they're called to go on to foreign fields? Not really. 
I believe they're called to a husband. I believe they're called to be in their father's house. I believe they're called to a husband. Amen. That's what I believe. Why? Because I, I, I see that in the scriptures. Right. I see it in the scriptures. I believe that what the Bible says about that, that the word of God be not blasphemed. And I pray that the Lord would help you to see the importance of the ministry that God has given you and that your goals would be centered upon honoring Christ, upon edifying and strengthening and helping your husband and upon raising your children. Because there's a, there's a, God made a husband and wife and that union of children together. They, he made it for a purpose. And the man is only part of that purpose. His wife is the other. And children need both. They need both. And they need to be raised in that nurture and admonition of the Lord together. They need a husband that knows what his role is. And a mother and a wife that knows what hers is. You would see the true power that God has given you. And you would use it for his glory. I pray that for you. I pray your duty to guard the purity and guard the hearts and minds of your children. In Jesus' name, that you would see that as a dire need. And when they're young and when they're, un, un, when they're not converted, you would see their hell-bound condition, that they deserve hell. But to point them to the Savior, that Jesus paid it all. You are the greatest soul winner by teaching them the, God, the scriptures and pointing them to Christ. That they ever, it is your sacred duty to teach them of Jesus Christ. As a mother... It is your duty to teach them the scriptures. You say, it's my husband's. He's the overall overseer. But it is your duty as a mother to teach them. Say, well, I'm waiting for my husband to do it. Well, that's unfortunate. Because you shouldn't be. If you have Christ in your soul, if you've been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, if your sins have been washed away, if you called upon the name of the Lord to be saved, then your sacred duty as a mother is to raise your children for Jesus Christ. It is to teach them the scriptures. It is to open them up and to give them devotions. It is to teach them the word of God. It is to guide them in their life for the Lord. You have a great number of years to nurture them and to raise them up. You are the greatest soul winner by teaching them the scriptures and pointing them to Christ, urging them to repent and believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, that they may believe the death, the burial, and the resurrection. And if any haven't come to Jesus today, come to Christ today. He'll change your life. He'll make all things new. He'll make you a new creature. He'll save your soul. He'll work a mighty work in your heart, and you'll never be the same again. Amen? 18 years ago, I remember. The Lord saved me and changed me and washed me and made me a new creature. And boy, did a lot of things get weeded out over the years. But we're stubborn and stiff-necked and rebellious, so it takes a long time, <laughs> right? It takes a long time. But God continues to do that work in your heart and your life. But ladies, please don't forget the importance of your duty. That God blesses the, your work. That God's hand is in your work. And he's watching it. And it's important. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you. Thank you for all that you do for us. We pray, Lord, that you just would sanctify our hearts with your word. Thy word is truth. Thank you for it. Lord, if there be one that's not saved, may they come to Christ today and be born again by the Spirit of God. Drop their pride, admit their lost condition, and turn to Christ and be saved. Lord, thank you for salvation. Thank you for eternal life. Thank you for the new life, the evidence of that new life, the work of the Holy Ghost in our hearts and our lives to keep us from wickedness and evil, to give us a new path to walk down and to teach us and mold us and train us to be what you want us to be. Thank you for saving my soul. Thank you for saving those that are here. Oh God, do a mighty work in our hearts today. Thank you for the fellowship of the saints. Thank you for the food that we're about to receive, the time that we have together. Lord, we're so unworthy, but we know that Christ is worthy. And we are here because of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.